Hello everybody and welcome to this third live Q&A with the Fertrella Animal Nutritionists. Our guests today are Jeff Maddox and Alyssa Walsh. They will answer your questions about swine nutrition and management. My name is Ingrid Benson from Tiga Acres, the Fertrella dealer in Canada, and I will be your host. Let me first introduce our guest. Jeff Maddox has been working as an animal nutritionist from backyard to commercial scale for 26 years. He's the author of Pastured Poultry Feeding and Management. His expertise and advices are always practical and have truly made raising animals much easier for a lot of farmers in the US, Canada and even farther abroad. We consider him to be one of the top animal nutritionists in the US. Alisa Walsh joined the Fertrell team three years ago after completing her master's degree in animal nutrition. She's been incredibly helpful in assisting a number of our customers with their feed rations and formulations. Fertrell is located in Pennsylvania and they go back all the way to 1946. They first started with natural fertilizers and then expanded to natural animal mineral mixes in 1974. Fertrell's mineral mixes are very well known and widely used across America and Canada because of their high quality and also because of one of their users, Joel Salatin of Polyface Farms. Most of you have probably heard of Joel, but if you have not, just Google him. You won't be disappointed by his down-to-earth approach to farming and life in general. Since today's show is about swine nutrition, you might like to check out Fertrell Swine Grower. The Fertrell Swine Grower is a high quality vitamin mineral premix. It promotes maximum performance and ensures optimal health. Fertrell uses the best ingredient for this premix, focusing on high bioavailability rather than just lesser cost. Better bioavailability means better absorption, better health and better weight gain, so more profits. It is an outstanding product and it's not really matched by competition. Fertrell's focus on nutrition has always been in line with organic and sustainable farming practices. Jeff and Alisa are happy to help us today and answer your questions, so let's get on with the show and I hope you enjoy it. What are the ideal living conditions for pigs? There are people who, you know, raise them in barns, some raise them on pastures. In your experience, what, <laughs> what's the environment that a pig thrive in, thrive in? They actually do the best in a woodlot under trees. Um, okay. If you have a small woodlot that you can fence off and let them live in under the trees and dig around the roots and, and uh, they'll be the most piggy that they can be. So, uh, you know, a lot of pigs sunburn. They don't like to be in direct sunlight. People don't realize that. Um, they are not, you know, sun worshiping critters. They, they prefer shade. Uh, they like to be comfortable, you know, something with a wet area so they can wallow when they need to, but uh, they're gonna do the best in a, in a, either a really heavy brush or in a tree lot is where they're gonna be the happiest. Okay, how much, uh room like square foot uh, would you allow per pig to live comfortably if you don't want to them too that's a tough yeah that's a tough answer it, it increases as they get bigger of uh -huh. course so yeah. um you know one pig could uh, and i don't know how it translates to metric units but um you know to live well and comfortable but also utilize the land efficiently you're going to be looking at about an eighth of an acre per pig during its grow out for six months uh -huh. okay uh, now i have a question from carrie joe i'm going to put it up here how much should i be feeding a dry sole or boar mm. That I feel like is kind of a tricky question because it really just depends on body condition. Um, but I think a good rule of thumb, and Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, is like four to six pounds of feed. Yep, that's exactly right. Uh, I usually just say six pounds, but if they've got really good forage and they're on good ground somewhere where they can find other things, um, 
uh, and we should have thought about getting this so we could pop it up, but a body condition score for pigs. Yeah. And, you know, so we could talk about the different body condition scores and, you know, I, you know, I can look, I can look for it real quick to see if we can find it, but yeah, you don't want them too fat. You don't want them too skinny. So right. getting that trained eye of how, and you always judge a pig based on the rump on the back end looking from the from the back end forward and <clears throat> that's how the body condition scoring is done uh, on pigs all right i have a question from kenny troiano hi kenny glad to see you here chickens do well on a 20 percent protein what do you look for in a pig ration particularly for breeders Uh, Can I take it a listener or not? Um, yeah, I can. Um, so if they're gestating, usually a 16%, but I think in that period, I'd say 16%. That's what I'm gonna, my final answer on that. 16% sal ration, that's usually going to have higher vitamins in it as well. Yep, I agree. 16 usually will do it, um, again, depending on body condition and how the pig looks. Uh, you could go to an 18, but it would be completely unnecessary in a good, well-managed environment. How do you feel about a 14%? Uh, if you're manipulating the amino acids correctly, you could get by with a 14%, but usually a 14 is not going to be enough. Okay. Um, the limiting... Uh, amino acid for chickens is methionine. Which one is it for pigs? Lysine, Lysine. actually. Yeah. Lysine. Okay. Lysine. That's how, the number one. Methionine is a close second. <clears throat> how much lysine do you want to see in a good um, uh, swine ration? Okay, so as a baby piglet, I'm looking at 1.3% of the diet. And as it gets older, it gradually drops. So, you know, for that first 40, 50 pounds, 1.3, uh, 1.4% lysine. Then once it gets, say, 50 to 100 pounds, 1 1.2, 1 1.25. Once it gets over that 100, 150 pound mark, 1.1 is usually enough. Um, and I just kind of leave it there. Then mature pigs for maintenance, like sows, boars, etc., somewhere between 0.9 and 1 is a good lysine level. Okay. I have another question here from Carrie Jo. Is there a guideline for feeding in the winter? Like how much to add depending on the temperature? So Carrie Jo, where are you located in Canada? That might help. Um, well, uh, this time, Jeff, what kind of uh, climates do you do you have? Is it like really cold, or are you more temperate? And is this for sows or feeders? Because I don't, I don't personally think you should limit feed for feeder feeder pigs. Put it out free choice for them. You are outside of Quenelle. Quenelle. So Quenelle, that's uh, that's BC. That probably gets. Uh, do you get like really cold winter there? You're pretty much up north. Sorry about that. So she she says she's talking mostly about souls and boars. <clears throat> the winter. Yeah, so she may need to, depending on how cold she gets, um, yeah, minus 30, minus 40, pretty cold. So she would want to adjust, make adjustments. And again, it's really, we don't want to change the amount of protein that the animal's ingesting. Um, we just need to be able to supplement an energy source to compensate um for those temperatures but i have never seen a table or a chart 
uh, I've never seen one developed to explain how to adjust those calories, you know, um, or that amount of feed, but I wouldn't give them more of the same 16% feed. Okay. So I would limit that. And then I would feed them something like, you know, barley or oats or wheat. Uh, be careful with the wheat. It can cause some constipation with pigs, but you know, just adding extra energy. We can even do it with an oil, a vegetable oil, uh, something along those lines. That's really high energy that has no protein to it. So those are some of the options that we could consider. Okay. Is there another question from somebody who is online? And what we're waiting, oh yeah, there is. Hang on, let's take that one first. So first, let's finish this one. Carrie Jo is asking how much she should add of that uh, energy source. I can't answer that right off the top of my head. So <clears throat> pigs are really good down to zero. Uh, even slightly below without making any major modification. Um, once you start talking nine, minus 10, minus 20, minus 30, then um, I'd have to sit down and do some mathematical uh, calculations. Carrie Joe, you're welcome to email me after the show and I'll see if I can work up uh, and get the right information to help you out. But I don't know that right off the top of my head. So let's go to this question here. I'm looking for for a custom pellet. Any recommendation for suppliers? We have Meishan and Kun Kun, so like the option to make adjustments. Now, that might be hard for you to answer for what's available in Canada. Where are you located, Tara? Oh, car stairs, Alberta. Oh, you're really close to us then. Um, well, what I what I can suggest if you're open to something that is not a pellet is that you contact um, a Gascon custom milling. They are in Sundry and they make an organic non-GMO ration. Um, here in Sundry, they use the Fritrell um, swine grower in it, and that that would be an option. So you say we currently do a custom double rolled ration and add swine mineral. So are you looking for something that you can add to what you are already feeding or to replace it? I just, uh, we're very happy with our mix, but looking to make it easier, especially in the winter as soaking is a lot of work. So you're wanting a pellet because of the fines or waste? If the ration does not have enough lysine, what is a way to add that? So that was from Carrie Jo. Oh, and I mean, in Canada, most of the feed mills all have lysine because of the ingredients that they have available to make feed with. So she should be able to purchase. Hopefully, she can purchase it, and uh, it gets added at one half one half percent of the diet by weight. So mm -hmm. if she know has a known amount times 0.5% is gonna be the typical adding, you know, the amount to add. 
but and you can't add too much, you know, so if you, if you overdid it, they're just going to flush it through like a protein. Um, but chances are they're not going to waste it. They're going to utilize it. Right. But if you're looking for a more natural source, crab meal or soybeans, frozen soybeans might be an option. Yeah. Back to Tara, she said that she was looking for the efficiency of a pellet and she has no waste because they are great at cleaning it up. Yeah. I mean, if a pellet's your personal preference, but if they're doing fine on the mash, I'd keep them on a mash. Ingrid, am I able to share? I, I sent you the document as well, but of the body condition score for the for sows, mm -hmm. and it would hold out. Um, uh, I have a share button, but I don't know if it'll work or not. I can try it. Yeah, try it, try it. I'll put you, uh, how can I do this? Uh, let's see. Try sharing it and I'll see what comes on my screen and then I'll... <clears throat> Did it show up? Add to stream. There you go. There you go. So this gives them a pretty good guideline of what we're talking about with body condition scoring. And, you know, down at the bottom, it's, I mean, it's pretty simple. You know, number one is emaciated, two is thin, three is ideal, four is fat, and five is overly fat. So um, <clears throat> if people have a way to capture this picture or, you know, if they reach out to me later, I can make sure I send it to whomever. I just sent it to you, Ingrid, so you also have it. People can reach out to you. Ingrid, can just, you put that on Facebook? I think so. What format, what format is it? This is just a Microsoft Word document. Yeah, so. and it's a picture sure. as well. Yeah. You know what I'll do is uh, when we record, when I do the recording, mm -hmm. I'll, um, I can take a screenshot of that and have it so that it's, it's you know, I can put a link to, to something. I can link to it somewhere. That's not a problem. Perfect. <clears throat> I've often looked around different places on the internet looking for a good body condition score. This is the one I prefer. This is the one I like the most because it's, mm -hmm. it's really simple. It doesn't get <clears throat> weight. It doesn't talk with six syllable words. And, you know, it's just easy to understand. And mm -hmm. um, I think it's got it, pictures. It's, yeah, it's got pictures. Anything with pictures is better. <laughs> exactly. So keeps things interesting. All right. All right. <clears throat> okay. So now let me go back to this. There we go. So does somebody else have a question? If not, I can. All right, so here is one. What are the common nutritional deficiencies in pigs and what would be the symptoms? What do you see the most? I mean, I know you see a lot of, of farmers. Uh, you probably get a lot of emails asking about this, that, and the other. What do you see the most and how can it be? Uh, what are the symptoms and how can it be remedied? Jeff, I'll let you answer that one. Okay. Um, I mean, the first thing that I see is just poor, slow, or, you know, poor growth characteristics. Like the, the pig is not getting fed enough and it's just not growing. Because most pigs, except for like uh, Asabas, Kunikun, some of the heritage breeds, most of the pig breeds out there today are capable of finishing in six or seven months, maybe eight months. Uh, some are a little slower. You know, they should be able from birth to slaughter weight, you know, should be done between six and eight months. But, you know, back to that body condition score uh, sheet, you know, if you go out and you see growing pigs that are developing and you can see their spine, you can see sharp bones on them, they're just not getting enough. So, uh, I mean, the, the, the number one thing I see is people just aren't feeding their pigs enough. Um, you know, big pigs, I use the term bulletproof. They're, they're, they're pretty bulletproof. They're not hard to raise whatsoever. If you keep them comfortable and keep them well-fed, 
Um, there's not much that really bothers a pig, you know, but, you know, if they're not getting fed right or enough, you know, I'll see wormy pigs because they're spending more time rooting around in the ground and eating things they probably wouldn't normally eat. Um, every now and then I see a little bit of botulism, you know, because they've eaten something decayed and rotten. But uh, pigs, pigs are actually one of the easiest keeping farm critters you'll ever have. I mean, they just, you know, pigs and turkeys are my two favorite animals on a farm. So, <clears throat> and there's not too many, I mean, of all the farm animals out there, right? Pigs are the only one I know of that will go and manure in the same place every day. Okay. They don't go just wherever they go to a location. Like if you have them in a pen, they go to a certain corner. That's where they do their business. I mean, pigs are really, really smart. Never, ever underestimate a pig. So. That's interesting you should say that because last night I was reading Little House on the Prairie <laughs> and my father was saying the same thing, that pigs are clean, that they go they go yeah. in the same spot every day. <laughs> yeah. They do. Yep. Surprisingly clean. <laughs> From a person who used to shovel out pig, pig pens, you know, with a pitchfork and a shovel, I can attest to you that they went in the same corner every... Now, that's if you kept if you were in there cleaning it on a regular basis, if you as a manager aren't in there, you know, once or twice a week cleaning that out, then they're going to go to another corner or another spot, or they're going to, but if you, it, it, you know, if they're being managed correctly, yes, they will deposit their manure in the same place every day and uh, makes it really handy for cleanup. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have to go all over the place. Yeah, I know when I came barns where our milking cows were, sometimes you thought that they just like, they just mapped the place and decided that there wasn't going to be a spot that didn't need to be cleaned up in the morning because it was just, just all over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they just organized the work to make work. <laughs> okay, next question. What do you think of soy-free feed? Can pigs do well on, on it? Yeah, yeah. they can. You want to expound upon that, Alyssa? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, soy-free feeds are they do pretty well um, in general. I think they do better on soy-free feed rather than chickens do. It's tough to get the amount of lysine that we need for pigs on a soy-free feed. So if you can supplement it with amino acids, that's great. Peas are a great feed ingredient for pigs. They do really well on it. If you do like peas, oats, and barley, that makes a pretty and mineral that makes a good pig feed. Um, yeah, I don't know how the what the difference in feed conversion is for that. It's probably going to be a little bit higher. Or have you, what have you seen, Jeff? Yeah, it is a little bit higher, but it's not horribly higher. Not like other animals, uh, right. not like chickens and, and other things. Um, but barley and peas makes a really good mm -hmm. pig feed. You're probably going to add a couple weeks to the grow out. I mean, they're going to be a little bit slower, but if you're not supplementing with enough lysine and things like that. Um, the feed's a little bit lower in energy, you know, just because those are low energy grains, yeah. but they'll actually do very well. And barley makes some of the best textured pork you're ever going to eat. Um, it just gives it a whole other texture. It's not too firm, but it's not too soft. And um, so, yeah, barley and pigs, uh, barley or oats and pigs go together very, very well. Yeah, I've heard from a lot of people say that barley gives a nice texture to me, firms it up a bit. Okay, and then I have another one here. Uh, here you go. Is teeth clipping necessary? Lots of folks clip the pickets to prevent damage to the soles. What, what do you think? Uh, I thought we did it when I was a kid and we clipped teeth. I thought it was more so they didn't grow the big tusk, you know, so those teeth didn't grow out and curl mm -hmm. up and become a danger, you know, to everything else in their environment. Um, and I mean, we did it. Is it necessary? I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. it was no fun and they really squeal, but you know, it's, I don't think it really hurt them. They were back to being fine and normal within about 10 minutes. So, 
I don't know that it was a big deal. Um, I don't, I, I don't know that it is necessary. If you don't clip the needle teeth on a pig, I'm guessing that the sow is going to probably kick them off and wean them earlier. Mm -hmm. She won't allow them to nurse quite as long. So I'm thinking that six to eight weeks, she's probably going to kick them off. Um, but I, I think that's a personal preference. I don't think that there's, you know, any good data to say yes or no that you have to do that. Is, is my feeling on that? Is it pretty common? It is. Yeah. Yeah. At the same time, they do, they do castration. They'll do the needle mm -hmm. teeth, so they'll separate out the whole litter or the whole group, and they'll start working through. Now, the conventional world doesn't have to worry about it because they wean a piglet at seven to ten days. Right, mm -hmm. they don't they don't stay on very long, so <clears throat> they're not really worried about the needle teeth. They still do the castration, of course, but um, but people that are more naturally minded and allow the sow to do a self weaning, they will tend to clip the needle teeth, uh, so there's less damage to the sow. But you know, the sow's only going to tolerate so much of that pain and suffering before she mm -hmm. kicks them off or stands up and walks away or something like that. So. Right, right. And then I have another question here. How to prevent stillbirth? Is it caused by nutritional deficiencies? In other words, maybe what kind of a diet should a pregnant soul be on to make sure that she's got everything it takes to, you know, bring about a healthy litter? Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, the sow needs to be on a good diet regardless, you know, with enough vitamins and minerals and, and proper nutrition. Um, stillborn piglets can come from a multitude of different things. Pretty much uh, there's there's two or three diseases, viral type diseases that'll stay in a pig that can cause this. Uh, lepto being one of them, leptosporidia. And I mean, poor nutrition can do it. Uh, sometimes even the age of the sow. You know, when she starts getting six, seven years old, um, her utero membrane isn't as good at, you know, she's just not as good at keeping those piglets in prime condition down there. So you start to see a little bit more stillborn or mummies, as we call them, um, as a sow gets older. You can also see it from high mycotoxins in the feeds. You know, those mm -hmm. mycotoxins will interfere with the yeah. nutrient absorption or transfer of nutrients. So it, it's, it's, I'm not just going to put my finger on one thing and say, you know, stillborn are, is this, right? Because mm -hmm. there's so many things that can affect that. Um, but nutrition is always a key part of it, right. you know. If she's but, taken too uh, long to labor, can't that cause still, stillborns as well? Yeah, it can. Yeah, there's, there's a, and I don't know the number. But there's there's a length of time from when she starts labor that she's basically going to give up and the piglet has to be out within, you know, so many minutes or like an hour um, in, in order to. And the best pig managers that I know, you know, swine keepers, you know, um, they're reaching up, you know, they're lubing up and they're and they're reaching up inside there. You know, if they don't see anything progressing, like as long as there's a piglet coming, they kind of stay out of it as long as she's pushing. Now, when she stops pushing, they'll still reach up inside there while the cervix is open and make sure that there's no mummies left inside. And a lot of people aren't willing to do that, right? So if, if there's one left inside, then she's going to go septic or it's going to really interfere with any future breeding of that sow. So while it doesn't sound like a lot of fun and it's not um you know if you're going to do long-term you know sow care you, you need to probably you know you probably should start that practice of you know you just go in there and you feel around and make sure that everything's out okay but you need to be sterile you need to probably have a glove with some proper lubrication you know do it the right way um you know for the sake of the sow and you know if you want to keep her around, if she's that good, it's something you want to consider doing. 
Yes, uh, so when when we try to deal with mycotoxins with chickens, you can use something like zeolites or the Redmond conditioner. What do you recommend for pigs? Same. Same? Same. 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 Yeah. Same. All right. And you just sprinkle that on their feed and they eat it or mix it in the ration? Yeah, I usually think. we'll add it in at 1% to 2% of the diet, mm -hmm. depending okay. on how strong the toxins are. Okay. Uh, pigs will actually free choice zeolite quite nicely. So... That's also an option. Okay, sounds good. If people see their pigs eating dirt, literally digging up fresh dirt, you know, like somewhere where nobody else is manured or urinated, and they're actually eating the dirt, not just playing with it, but they're consuming it, mm -hmm. um, they probably should get some zeolite out there and, you know, start free choicing it. The pigs have a bellyache from something, so we might as well fix it. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, next question. Uh, what is erysipelas? Can it be prevented with good nutrition and management? Are there, um, you know, alternative treatments? I'm sure that there are uh, conventional treatments for it, but do you know of anything more alternative, uh, maybe less aggressive that works? I don't even know that there's a really good antibiotic out there for urosyphilis. Um, you know, and once you, it, it, to my knowledge, urosyphilis only affects uh, pigs and turkeys. It's kind of a really unique viral type infection. And um, the only way that I know 100% to get rid of it, well, let's back up. The only way that I know 100% to verify that you have it is to submit an animal to a diagnostic laboratory for testing, okay? It's very hard to diagnose on farm because it takes, it, it has a lot of um, symptoms that look like other things. So it's going to throw you off and you're going to be treating it for this or treating it for that. And, um, or sometimes you'll just see an unexp completely unexplained death, right? The the pig was com looked completely normal, no symptoms, nothing mm -hmm. the previous day, and you'll come out and it'll be, you know, just laying there spread out and dead. And, and you just scratch your head like, well, what happened? So, you know, that animal needs to get in and get tested. Um, but, so, oh, huh? real, hold on before you go on with that. But another symptom of that is a diamond raised red patch on the skin. It's harder to see on the heritage, the darker heritage breeds, but I read that if, if you see something diamond shaped, red and raised, or like, um, yeah, that's another sign of it. Sorry to interrupt you, I just wanted to throw <clears> that's all right. Um, down here, what we've had to do is we do 100% eradication of animals, mm -hmm. so we're basically depopulating uh, for a given period of time. Now, the worst news that I have is the urosyphilis can actually stay in the soil as a soil-borne pathogen mm -hmm. for many years. So how to sterilize that soil, I really don't have a good answer. So, I, I mean, hopefully you don't have a bunch of urosyphilis in Canada. I mean, you, you must be hearing about it somewhere because I didn't expect to hear urosyphilis mm -hmm. come up when, but anyway. <laughs> I was surprised about that question too. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. hardly ever hear. I've only had probably three or four cases, and mm -hmm. most of it's been in turkeys. Yeah. Um, so I, I did read that it takes only 35 days to rest that pasture, and then you can bring it. It only lives in the soil for 35 days. Is that not correct? I've heard varying opinions. Okay. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, we can go with 35 days. You've seen it, read a paper on it or an article that, you know, so. It's risky but, nonetheless, though. Yeah, right. And I, who knows what's carrying it. Um, I had an understanding that, like, laying hens and other fowl aren't affected by it, but they can be carriers of it. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Does anybody have another question? before I put on the next one. The next question. Oh, there is. This is a good one. How can you ensure that the pig will put on weight as muscle rather than fat? <laughs> yeah. Feeding the right amount of protein. Go ahead, Alyssa. 
I just said pretty much what you said, a well formulated diet if you have enough protein in there. So if you're if your diet is higher in energy, so like if you're just feeding straight corn or straight barley, for example, they're not getting enough protein. So they're not going to grow. And if they do grow, they're going to be real fatty. Um, so. so a balanced ration will do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Some breeds now also know certain of the heritage breeds as that when the days start getting shorter at the end of summer, their instinct is to pack on fat. So your harvest date, when you start the pig and when you harvest the pig can be a big role in how that, I mean, nutrition is number one, but there is some, some instinctual, like with large blacks, um, you know, to just put on, you know, they're, they're waiting for winter, right? They, they need to survive winter. So they're going to put on inches of fat and uh, for self-preservation. We kind of do that too, eh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the best time of year. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is a question for K from Kerry Jo. We are bringing in a new little board. Do we need to quarantine anything else to reduce stress, etc.? Yeah, I think you should quarantine. Just from a disease standpoint, I would quarantine it. Um, you know, at least two to three weeks. Keep it separated. And... Uh, probably try and stress it a little bit just to see if it's got any latent illnesses that, you know, may be covered up by, you know, the previous owner, nutrition, whatever. So, you know, stress it a little bit, maybe let it go a couple of days without feed, put it in a rough environment um, just to make sure that it's not carrying something in. And if she trusts the source and she thinks that it's perfectly fine, then, you know, that they're her pigs, but I would recommend a quarantine. Mm -hmm. um, and then it, pigs aren't like chickens. So intermingling or co-mingling, bringing in like a, a strange, you're going to have a couple hours of fighting and gnashing of teeth, you know, to mm -hmm. figure out where everybody fits in the, in the circle of life in that pen. And then they'll, uh, they should calm down. But you know, she's bringing in a boar. So if she's waiting until the sow's in heat, then, you know, taking the boar, either taking the sow to the boar or the boar to the sow, um, you know, there won't be any issues. There won't be any fighting going on at that particular time. So. <clears throat> Kerry Jo says it's traveling seven hours soon. So enough stress. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the reason we are recommending stress is like with it's the same with chickens when they go through some stress and you said there is a period of time when you know if there is stress like that and they have some latent illnesses it's more likely to come out because right. of stress yep. and you know that it's there in the animal yep. uh, because of the stress right yeah i would still quarantine it for a couple of weeks unless she needs to breed like right away with it um, but I'd, I'd quarantine it for still two to three weeks just to make sure uh, nothing strange happens. And, you know, I'm hoping she got a guarantee on the pig, on the boar. So if something does happen, you know, if she keeps it quarantined, she can call the other breeder and say, hey, I had a problem with this. And But if she co-mingles it and the rest of the herd, you know, beats him up or, you know, whatever. Uh, mistreats him then she doesn't really have anything to say you know to come back to the other breeder so it could be injury related at that point or something else so two to three week quarantine would be great yeah okay. does anybody else have another question i'll go with this one so piglets are given iron shots to prevent anemia do you in your experience is it necessary can it be pre you know can you make it so that you don't need that if the mom has a proper diet if the piglets have a proper diet is it possible that the the mother would have enough to provide for the needs absolutely yeah yeah, I mean, that's what they don't get iron shots if they're in the wild. So she should be, if she's fed a well-balanced diet, she's going to be able to provide that through her milk. 
Okay, I just wondered about that if because uh, I see a question commenting about that and I, I tend to believe that nature is do, does things well and that um, you know provided the mother is you mm -hmm. know well and has what it takes to give it of course um, that provision should be made you know with a good ration for the for the soul to pass mm -hmm. that on to the to to the piglets do you know if there are any like long term, long term, and desirable side effects to the shots? None that I know of. Um, you know, it'll store some of the excess iron, but a lot of it'll just pass right through. Um, but you know, like Alyssa was saying, in the wild, but even you know, in the type of animals that we promote being out on real ground, you know, they're going to root around. So even if their diet was minor deficient in iron, mm -hmm. you know, they're going to root around and find what they need, right? They're going to, they're going to find it out there somewhere uh, if they have that option. So, yeah, and if they have enough space for it. Yeah. But uh, back to as long as that sow's diet has enough iron in it and it's properly balanced, then I've never had to, uh, n none of the folks that I've worked with give any iron shots that I'm aware of. Okay. We mm -hmm. just don't do it. Um, when we had pigs and I was a kid, we didn't give iron shots back then either. So, mm -hmm. you know, so where this comes from, I don't know, but, you know, people are worried about tail biting and ear biting and, you know, things like that. And, uh, cause once they get another one to start bleeding, then, you know, that blood provides them the iron that they seem to be, they think that they're needing. So, um, the zeolite will actually help with that as well. Free choice of light to the piglets yeah. will help with tail biting. See, sometimes that tail biting is a behavioral thing. Is the lights too bright? Uh, are they too crowded? Things like that. So it may not just be an iron deficiency. It could be some other things triggering it. Right. So back to Carrie Jo here and her boar. She says he's just weaned and my souls are a month and a half older. He's coming from another organic farm. You still nice. quarantine them. Yeah. yeah, you still quarantine them. And I mean, a month and a half older in the life of a pig is a pretty big size difference. So, you know, I would wait a couple of weeks to, to co-mingle them if it was me, Carrie Joe. I just, just to be safe. Um, you know, we're, we're assuming that the other organic farm is really good, clean, top notch and the whole bit and not, you're not going to bring any diseases in. But I don't know that it's worth the gamble, you know, just to keep them quarantined for a couple of weeks. Okay. Okay, there is a big one here. Do you need to deworm pigs? <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> if they have internal parasites, yeah. So um, there are simple measures that can be taken to lower or prevent the parasite load. Uh, any natural alternatives? I mean, side effects to the common dewormer, I suppose it's kind of like for the for poultry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, the common dewormers are losing their effectiveness anyway, 30 to 40% effective. So, you know, uh, I mean, if you want to waste your money on that, that's fine. Um, Again, we don't have issues with folks with, you know, internal parasites with their pigs. Um, feeding high levels of oats and barley in the diet really help to ward off per internal parasites. Uh, balanced nutrition, keep them in a clean environment. You know, um, pigs have gotten a bad rap about being parasite carriers over the years. You know, people, that's why... You can't eat pig unless it hits 165 degrees or 170 degrees to make internal temperature to make sure you kill off all the parasites. Well, when they're living in, you know, a, a not safe, clean environment, then that's a truthful statement, right? But if they're out and they're able to roam around, eat some grass, be a pig, uh, being fed and cared for well, I, I don't see any reason to ever need to worm a pig. But it all depends on the management technique. Yes, so the answer to worming is is management. Right. Right. I mean, they don't eat grit like chickens. So um, crazy like enough, they probably will. Yes. Um, oh, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
But it, they don't need to. They, they shouldn't be. Right? <laughs> Probably got a little in there, but. But I've seen some pigs eat gravel before, so. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, maybe they have a need for something. Um, if there is no other questions, I'll move to this one. What causes the greasy pig disease on hot foods? Do you have any natural way of treating it? It's a staph uh, bacterial infection in the skin. I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can you do garlic oil topically? Will that fix that? Yeah. So garlic that's is what, That's what I would do. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> garlic is nature's antibiotic, so if you can get garlic oil to make it, do you let the garlic sit in the oil for 30 days? Longer than that? Yeah, one full moon cycle, but when I start talking about moon cycles, people get all weirded out. If I say 30 days, they don't care, right? Wow. It, it sounds scientific <laughs> well, if I say 30 days. Um, 30 days. But, so, yeah, you know, um, <clears throat> 30 days, you can let the garlic soak in the oil. It's uh, one bulb, six to eight cloves per quart of olive oil. Um, just put it in a place that's not in the direct sunlight it can be a little bit on the warmer side that helps with the steeping or the seeping mm -hmm. and uh, make your own you know antibiotic alternative but that's good to works have great. On hand too what's that so it's good to have on hand so if you make it today and you don't have this is. issue for now it'll it'll keep so yeah it doesn't have a shelf life as long as you take good care of it and you know you don't expose it to a lot of stuff and set it in the sunlight <clears throat> It, it'll keep for years. I've got garlic oil that tincture at home that's been mm -hmm. 10 years or more old. Still works fine. So, so you put that on topically? How I would many? put it on topically. Hmm? How often are you doing that? You're probably going to, I mean, because it's a pig and just knowing a pig, you're probably going to have to do that daily. Okay. Um, and they're not going to mind. You know, pigs like affection and attention. Mm -hmm. So it's not hard to get up there and, you know, smear, get a cotton ball and smear some garlic oil on it. Yeah. The problem you're going to have is all the pen mates or the litter mates with that pig are going to be up there licking it yeah. off because, you know, it just. Yeah. So if you could separate the pig? Yeah, you could. That's going to help at least let it soak in for a little while. Yeah. Um, no need to put a bandage or anything on it. Just leave it open to the air and that's going to work as good as anything I know. Mm -hmm. Can you do something internally to strengthen the immune system? Uh, I mean, you could give it some extra vitamin E. Um, you know, again, just good diet is, is going to mm -hmm. be uh, a good diet is going to ward off most of this. Um, I've only heard of one or two cases of greasy pig, and it's people that were literally feeding slop and garbage to their pigs, right? Not There was no vitamins, no minerals, no, mm -hmm. you know, they were just trying to raise the cheapest pig possible. And, you know, that's the only time I've ever had or seen, you know, cases of greasy pig. Yeah. You could probably do the garlic orally as well if you wanted to, but I don't think it's necessary. Okay, so Gary Jo has another question. If a pig has dry skin, what might be wrong or how to fix? That's a really good question. And, I, you know, I think uh, that there's not enough dietary fat in the diet. So look at the ration and calculate it out. But if you're not above 4%, between 4 and 6% um, of oil or fat in the ration, then it, it's going to directly uh, affect the skin. The other thing that I see it is a lot of people bed their hogs, particularly in the wintertime with old hay and some types of old hay, you know, like what I refer to as mulch hay, you know, stuff that's not fit to feed other animals. But uh, some hays will also cause skin irritation and skin condition problems. Jenny had a question. Is it good to have more than one pig when raising for meat? You know, competition for feed and all. It's good to have it's a always, Yeah, it's always better to have more than one. Mm -hmm. Two yeah. at least. But you can successfully raise one pig because they will bond with a human being quite well. And um, the reason I like turkeys and pigs are my two favorite farm animals 
they're always happy to see you when you show up right and it's not just because you're feeding them so <clears throat> yeah you, you can bond with a pig uh, they have great personalities if you start young and you know scratch them play with them etc you don't need to but yeah two is definitely better everything um, does better with a buddy yep everything's better with a buddy yeah so Carrie Joe said the crude fat in the ration is two percent, and the hay is good. So is the two percent enough? No. no, no. That's why she's seeing the dry skin. So <clears throat> just like us humans, and just like the chickens and everything else that we talk about, what I'm finding is I'm looking for about a five percent dietary fat mm -hmm. balances out um, rations quite well. So. And I see she's asking how to add fat. And I, Carrie Joe, I don't know what you have access to. Um, I don't know if there's something at the feed mills. Like an um, organic oil. That's where you yeah. can get that from, right? Where? Yeah. An oil, like an organic right. oil. Yeah. And she's organic. So, yeah. you know, um, if she wasn't organic, I would say go to a butcher shop and get some beef tallow. Beef tallow is a perfect, you know, option for fat. Mm -hmm. And I don't have any problems with pigs eating beef tallow. Um, you know, they're an omnivore anyway, so eating meat is in their in their genetic, you know, profile and instinct. So, <clears throat> um, but if you can if you can source some type of organic oil, vegetable oil, you know, canola, soybean, linseed. Of course, linseed is going to give you some strange flavoring, uh, you know, in that fat. So be careful how much linseed you use. Is that sunflower a oil. oil too? Huh? Is that a concern with canola oil too? It is in combination with feeding fish meal in the diet. So if her feed had fish meal, the combination of fish oil and canola oil will right. increase the chances of fishy flavor. Okay. So maybe that's like something. She's for right. Canada. No, yeah. no. Organically speaking, you're not allowed to feed feed any meat. Uh, meat byproducts from domestically raised animals. So she can't feed like chicken fat, beef fat, or anything like that. That's been in the rule since they wrote it, the organic rule years ago. So, yeah, she's, she's right. Now, they've made exceptions for things like fish meal and crab meal, but that's not a good option, you know, in her case. So finding some, you know, some, finding some oil yeah, olive oil is fine if you want to invest in organic olive oil. There's not a problem with that. Um, oil is usually, well, I mean, you know that you're at 2%, so we want to add 2% by weight. So uh, however much you're feeding them every day and, you know, multiply times 2% is what you're, at least 2% is what you're going to add. There is. Let me go to the next question here. How do you treat scours in piglets? Definitely take that one. <laughs> I was waiting on you. <laughs> I know you were. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, so, from what I've read, you can give humates to them. That's an option, um, but I don't know how available humates are in Canada. Um, also, making sure that you're weaning them. You don't wean them too early. That's going to help prevent scours also. Yeah. And that is all I have. Jeff, your turn. Um, so over the years, things that I've learned that will control scours or stop scours are things like diatomaceous earth. Um, zeolite helps some, depending on what is causing the scours. And uh, believe it or not, raw eggs does a nice job. You know, feed them one to two raw eggs, and that should stop the scours. It depends on their age. That's more for the immature piglets, the very young. Mm -hmm. um, and then if it's right after weaning, I would probably be doing a combination of egg, diatomaceous earth, and zeolite. Just kind of use the egg to mix it all together and kind of hold it. Mm -hmm. Kind of like a real dry cookie dough kind of thing. And, you know. If that should shut it off. Um, diatomaceous earth is a natural moisture scavenger, like it's going to absorb moisture. 
So it's going to go in there and basically just slow everything down and, and kind of plug it up and give it a chance to reset. What about something like um, uh, bentonite clay or charcoal? Have you tried that or heard anything? Yeah, I mean, the charcoal is like the humates. Um, again, it's going to go in there more as a detoxifier. Uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't dry anything up. It doesn't have a binding action. So in the same way with the bentonite clay. So if your scours are coming from a bacteria or a pathogen, then yes, you're going to see positive. Well, from the clay, it needs to be something from a uh, like a poisonous substance. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, but the, the clay and the charcoal will work against uh, mycotoxin. So if it's a mycotoxin doing it, mm -hmm. but it, it, it just depends. You know, if they're bloody scours, it could be coccidiosis. Then it's going to be a completely different treatment at that point. So Yeah, that was my next question. Okay. Yeah, and it, you know, I, I, again, at 26 years of doing this, I have not seen coccidiosis in pigs. Mm -hmm. So this is really a poor management situation here. If if you uh -huh. get piglets, if you're starving your piglets and they're eating that much dirt uh, and debris and living in their own mess, um, that's where you're going to get coccidiosis. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, p pigs can live where chickens have been. Um, they actually like to you know, chew on chicken manure. I don't necessarily like that idea, but they, they will. Um, doesn't hurt them at all. Okay. So it's not, yeah, you, you've got to try hard to get a pig coccidiosis. I mean, you, you just, you know, <clears throat> yeah, that's not, I, I, I haven't seen it. Okay. Now, if, <laughs> if they, for some reason, they do get it, what you recommend for chickens is, uh, what is it, whole milk or kefir yogurt and all that? Would it work yeah. for pigs? Well, when they're really young, but then they're still getting mom's milk. So I, I don't know that they're going to be, um, you know, when they start getting older, I'd probably do the copper sulfate in the water. You oh, know, yeah? one ounce per five gallons of drinking water. If they're weaned and, you know, bigger, then I would probably go with the copper sulfate. Okay. Sounds good. And uh, now this is a something that I, you know, a question that we did get. Uh, what would cause a sow to bite and kill her entire litter as the piglets are being born or shortly after? Is that a nutritional deficiency? Is it she doesn't know what to do with them? Or what is it? What can cause that? Have you encountered that? I have. You see it. You see it often. And she's not in a comfortable environment when she gave birth and she feels threatened, um, like there's predators around, or she's just not, you know, she's just not completely calm and comfortable, okay? So her instinct is to kill the, you know, kill the litter. Um, usually, you know, she'll just bite them and kind of break their neck and, you know, may toss them off to the side, something like that. and. Now, if she's eating them, then it's a nutritional deficiency. But if she's just killing them mm -hmm. so that they quit making noise, you know, she's either in really severe pain, she's quite uncomfortable, or, you know, it's out of fear, you know, because she's not in an environment that she's comfortable in, you know. And people make this mistake. They put sows or gilts into an environment that's comfortable for the person managing the pigs to manage them but it's not necessarily a comfortable environment for, you know, that animal, especially if she's been separated. So if you're running them as a herd, you know, as a large group, and then all of a sudden you separate out one and put her in a pen somewhere where she's never been before, that that's a huge mistake, right? You can't just change her environment like that, you know, a hundred percent overnight and she's going to be freaked out you know so they're they are somewhat herd animals and they do live in groups so what i recommend is segregating an area where she can still see the rest of the the, the herd of pigs but she can have her own privacy area you know to have her litter and that calms her down to know that the community is out there surrounding her you know 
in a safe distance. So now you're starting to get into the mental side of pigs and that's, you know, so that's, but um, yeah. It's, it's part of it though. It's it is. Part, it's, it's important if you're gonna lose the whole litter. Yeah. Well, I, I, think it's I see it more in guilt. Uh, you can kind of, the more you are around pigs, you can kind of sense it. Um, usually, if it's it's rare to see an older sow do it, you know, once who's had one or two litters, it's usually first time moms that just freak out. So, but you kind of got to listen to the sounds that she's making, the actions that she's doing. And if she didn't make a nest in that area, like you provide nesting material, and if she didn't make a nest in there, she's not laying down being somewhat comfortable and calm and docile. Um, you need to have great concerns. She's not in a comfortable environment, right? So you just, you have to look for the warning signs. So this transition period, how many days before farrowing should you start it? Is a week enough? Should you do two weeks? What's the best to come? I'm not sure. Each pig's going to be a little bit different, right? Some pigs you can bring right in and it's not going to be an issue. She don't care, right? right? She's just happy for the new, you know, the new efficiency apartment or whatever. And, um, but, you know, some, you know, two weeks, it could take two weeks, right? Okay. And the really good pig managers actually provide nesting material. And um, if they're doing a hut or whatever, they're providing mm -hmm. their environment, you know, almost a month in advance to farrowing, you know, the projected farrowing date. So they can get really comfortable. They can right. nose around, they can smell everything. You know, they can push the hut or the shelter where they want to push it. They can, you know, um, and they're all different, right? Some don't even want to be in under a hut to have their, some will do it right out in the middle of the open. And so each one's different. You just got to watch for the signs and the symptoms. Um, and see how crazy she is just before farrowing. Mm -hmm. But sometimes confinement or an unknown area or an unknown space um, is just enough stress to to cause her to do that. So now let's say that you have one first time uh, mom do that. Is it uh, and you're breeding your pigs and you're trying to say, you know, decide who you keep and who you, you don't keep if she does that with her first litter is it reason enough to not breed her anymore or do you think she oh can no yeah she, absolutely no you fatten her back up and she you turn her into sausage and pork chops yeah. i mean just or, as quick as you can okay. there yeah, is know. there is some hereditary um that that is a hereditary trait that can pass mm -hmm. you don't know when it's going to pop up but it is a hereditary trait you know that mothering instinct is is truly mm -hmm. hereditary so you know, when you get that wonderful sow, then you want to be selecting guilts from her. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, so, uh, no, there's no second chances. If she doesn't raise a litter, you yeah. know, the only way you're going to get your money, part of your money back out of her is to turn her into a, a saleable pork. So, okay. uh, if you're doing it for a business, if you're doing it for a hobby and she's a pet, well, you can try as many times as you like. But it's pretty disheartening to go in and see a dozen baby piglets thrown all over the place and just, you know, um, I, I don't have the compassion to give them a second chance. Okay. That's just me. Especially if I've done my job right. Right. Good environment. Keep them calm. Well fed. But. Yeah, the, I think that, you know, when you try to build a herd, you know, whether it's cows or pigs, one strike and you're out is basically the rule of thumb that I hear, you know, good breeders, people who have reputable herds and, you know, a system that works well, because otherwise it's problems down the road. Let's say she does it a second time. Now it's two, you know, two seasons that you fed her for sausage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All yeah, right. you, f you fed her at least six pounds a day for two years now. Well, yeah. six months before you bred her. Mm -hmm. So pretty much two years um, or probably you could even say a year and a half, but you got 500 days, six pounds of feed. That's 3000 pounds of feed. 
So, yes. you know, what's yes. a ton of feed cost in Canada for sow feed? You know. A lot. <laughs> yeah. Yep. A lot. Yeah. Great. All right. Are there any more questions? We are at just over an hour, but if there is any more, we can still take them. And while we wait for that, Jeff, yep. what... Uh, if people are trying to do some reading to inform themselves or find some information, do you have any books that you recommend? I, I haven't found one. Um, I tell you, you know, one one of my go-to books is um, Frank Morrison's Feeds and Feedings, which they've they discontinued publications, but they did it from the early 1900s to the mid 1900s. Um, and it's got, <clears throat> it's what uh, a lot of us refer to as the old dead guy books. And a, a lot of times their information was not, um, while he was a Cornell university person, their, their research was not, uh, money driven to find a specific result for some large donor, right? It was still good raw, you know and they talk about things. So there's some really good information. And, you know, so if you can get your hands on a Morrison's Feeds and Feeding, it's actually available on a PDF. You can download it. It's a huge download. So once you bring it down, figure out where you want to put it. Um, and, you know, it, it's a four inch wide thick book. You know, I mean, it's it's got a lot of size to it and the print's not big, um, so. That's my favorite book. Uh, you're going to have to write one. When no. do you start on writing? No. no. <laughs> because when people ask me, where uh -huh. do I go to get information about chickens? I said, sure, easy enough. Get yeah. to the book. <laughs> it does make it a little tricky, but Carrie Jo did ask a question. Yes. Do you increase feed while pregnant? If so, how much at what rate? Again, Carrie Joe, it goes back to looking at that body condition score chart, you know, keeping her in that optimal three body condition score. Um, you may need a little bit more. You may not. Usually we get by with that four to six pounds quite well. But, you know, each pig is going to be a little bit different and each environment is going to be a little bit different. So you're just going to have to kind of learn the eye of evaluating her condition because you do not want her too fat or too skinny. If she's too fat when she when she births, when she uh, farrows, mm -hmm. it's going to be a real struggle. I mean, yeah. it's she's going to have a hard time. So you're going to be reaching in and trying to help her, you know, get those piglets out, you know, well, space more than once so yeah that's a good question yep and i have a last one okay what's your ideal uh pig ration if you were to make mix one for your own pig what would you make it with jeff what would you do <laughs> I, I, I'm corn, I'm corn, roasted soybean, oats kind of guy. Um, a little bit of fish meal. And, and I use a little bit of fish meal. And uh, Carrie Joe, the, the, our recipes um, that I've been using for over 20 years are on the Fertral website. Yeah. Yeah. And they are, they're, they're free to the public. You're welcome to go out there and look. Um, not everybody can find those ingredients, but <clears throat> I've yeah, had outstanding can. success with those. We can help formulate a ration too if you tell us our feed, your feed ingredients. We don't mind doing that. Yeah. So, do you increase feed after farrow? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, if there's more than six or seven piglets, I just put her on full feed and let her have whatever she wants. Mm -hmm. If she's yeah. only got six or seven, then I feed one extra pound of feed per piglet. Yeah. yeah. Lactation is pretty nutritionally demanding, so you got to make sure to, to keep that body condition for them. Because if she's not making milk, then those piglets aren't going to thrive, I think is the word I want to use. Yeah. Are there ingredients that help milk production? I mean, we used to give a little bit of oats to our milking cows. They, I mean, nursing ladies eat oats too because it helps. Is it the same for... 
I mean, it, uh, I mean, if you feed the a good sow diet, I think you're on the right path. I don't think necessarily supplementing with something else is going to increase that production unless, what do you think, Jeff? Well, I mean, our really good sow feed has oats in it, so yes. <laughs> yeah, but like you feed extra on top of that. No, sow no, right? I wouldn't. So. I wouldn't. If, you know, I use oats when I notice something, an animal is not um, eating well, like really sluggish to eat. So I'll soak some oats. Sometimes I'll soak them in vinegar. Sometimes I'll soak them in milk. Um, it's a really good appetite stimulant. And, you know, sometimes just soaking them in water is fine too, but uh, just depends on the animal. Yeah. But, <clears throat> yeah. yeah, soaked oats can be your friend. Yeah, you know, so if something decides to quit eating and, and doesn't want to. How can you talk to Jeff after this? Uh, Kerry Joe, if you want to email me, I can forward your email to Jeff. If you go to, uh, you should find our email here. I'm going to put it there. There, if you... If it's gonna do it for me, and last time I didn't want to, it's gonna put it. Go to here. Do I have it? Here? Yeah, right there. I have it up on the screen. If you want to email me, if you want to email me there, I'll for I'll be glad to forward your email to Jeff uh, and Alyssa, and they can help you with uh, with your questions. Okay, so if there is nothing else, I think, all right, there you go. Um, so if there is nothing else, I think, Jeff, is it your bedtime? <laughs> Sorry. It, yeah, I got up really early today and... Um... I'm just giving you a hard time because uh, sorry. You're, two, you're two hours ahead and I know you get up really early, so... Yeah. Yeah, us old farts got to go to bed early, so. Yeah, I should do that too. I should do that too. All right. I hope that you have the same clarity of mind as you have answering those questions. You might do that <laughs> early. All right. Well, thank you everybody for coming. If you yep. do have any questions after this, please feel free to to email me, and I'll put you in touch with uh, with Jeff and Alicia. And Alicia, it's my pleasure to do that. So don't hesitate. And we'll do what we can to help you and get you answers. Thank you guys for coming. And thanks, thanks. for all the questions. Yep. All right. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. See you later.